family. We were on family vacation, and we were in Moraine National Park in Botswana, and we were out on our morning game drive, and it was just exciting out there scanning for animals. The ranger spotted the leopard up in the tree, and he got very excited. He wasn't laying down or sleeping or resting. He was actually just perched up uh, very intently looking in one direction. The ranger said, why don't we just wait here a little bit? We might see a little action. And we looked over, and there was a group of impala feeding nearby. Of course, the anticipation started building, and before we knew it, the impala slowly moved in underneath the tree. The leopard had actually turned our direction and was very intently watching them, and then before we knew it, jumped right out of the tree. The leopard had just made the successful kill, and the feeling on the vehicle was just electric. Impalas that have come across hunting leopards would usually come across them on the ground. And that's why these impalas aren't really looking up. They're not expecting a leopard to come from above. When the leopard comes down, it's not actually trying to kill the impala with a downfall. It has to actually land safely first and then grab the impala. It's the bite that eventually kills it. So it was really great. We got to see the kill happen. The other impala scattered. So the leopard would then take that impala back up the tree, perhaps not the same tree, and then feed on it away from scavengers. The leopard dragged it off a little ways, and like they normally do, started climbing up the tree to try and hide the carcass. Actually fell. They dragged it around the backside of the tree, and it actually started eating the impala on the ground. You can just see the power of the animal dragging this impala. That also leaves a drag mark on the ground that rangers or trackers often follow to find leopard in the first place. The reason why we came on safari, we wanted to see the animals in the natural habitat and behaving like they naturally do. I know of a river where the salmon were coming in, uh, and up to 15 to 20 bears uh, were concentrating there at certain times to feed on the salmon. What I wanted to get was really up close, wide angle footage of uh, a bear eating a uh, salmon right in front of the camera. I set the camera up, I pushed record, and I went back with my group. And just about 20 minutes later, a female had that third summer cub, so two and a half year old cub started wandering up the creek, so I figured I was going to get lucky. The female did not notice the camera. She was very focused uh, while looking into the river and studying it, uh, looking to get fish. But <laughs> like the mother, the cub looked straight down at the camera, saw it immediately, and uh, then I thought, oh boy, this isn't what I wanted. Inquisitive behavior is very common in young animals, even young antelope. But progressively, as animals get older, this inquisitive nature often diminishes. But in bears, it tends to be there for the rest of their life. Being a bear, being especially being a young cub, flipped the camera over, and then my heart kind of sank because I saw the cub put the camera in his mouth and start chewing on it. The bite force of a grizzly can just snap something like that, not even try. When you look at the teeth, in that mouth, you realize that there is very little that a bear will not be able to crush and open up and get up at its insides. I thought the chances of, of, uh, of that camera surviving this encounter uh, were going to be just about zero. It actually gives us an incredible view into the oral cavity of a live bear. It's not chewing because it wants to eat the head cam, but unfortunately, if you don't have fingers, you have to have some other sensory way to explore a potential food source. The bear chewed on it for a while, and, uh, and then finally mother went out into the river to fish, and the cub lost interest. Uh, actually dropped it, picked it up a couple more times, um, and then they went off and ended up catching a fish and, and going on the other side of the river to eat it. So when the coast was clear, I went out and uh, retrieved this camera. And um, I, I noticed immediately, other than the fact that well, the camera was covered in bear spit, um, then the camera was actually still running. 
I immediately knew this, this is some really, really special stuff that I had. It was an up-close, full-frame view inside the bear's mouth. And you can see bits of salmon in the teeth, and you can see the bear's tongue, uh, the tongue rolling around. That's the last view a lot of uh, fish and other critters in Alaska see, is uh, inside the bear's mouth. And the next summer, I was guiding a group of eight photographers. We were right on the mouth of a river where it dumped into the ocean. Within about 30 minutes, we had um, a female brown bear and her two-year-old cub come down to the river. My GoPro was set up on a small, low tripod. I just put it in the sand so it's difficult to see. When the female um, saw us, um, she basically ignored us. But when the cub saw the camera, um, he just immediately deviated and took interest in the camera. Maybe the camera had a little bit of a mice scent on it or something. Um, it definitely made it made it more interesting to the bear. Bears have got very good eyesight, but they've got an exceptional sense of smell. They've got enormous nostrils, and often when you look at bears from close up, you'll see this flaring of their nose as they're picking up scents in the air, and that's how they find their food. I thought to myself, oh man, here it goes again. I'm gonna lose the camera this time, I'm sure. This is a, a very playful, very, I would say, naughty male cub. I know it very well. I um, kind of clapped my hands and said, hey, no. And then, all of a sudden, he just looks at the camera, looks at me, and then just, bam, don't do that. And knocked that camera about uh, 15 feet. It just, he had that look in his eye, and he just gave it his uh, strongest right hook. A lot of bears' behavior it stimulates us to think about our own inquisitive nature. There's a lot of anthropomorphic traits that we can allocate to bears. We've had a very close relation with them. They are exceptionally fascinating. These two experiences uh, really kind of sum up my feeling of bears. You never know what to expect. They're always going to be entertaining. They're always going to be funny. Um, they're always going to be intelligent, curious. This is uh, two pretty amazing experiences. That morning, we stopped at Saibo Dam. There was crocodile in the water and some impolos on the other side. They were afraid. They were skittish and jumping around. They were standing all close and closer to the water's edge, trying to cross. I haven't seen a kill before. And then I realized it's going to happen today. Suddenly, one of the young males jumped on the water. Impolos are prey for most other predators, like lions and leopards, and also crocodiles. Normal crocodile behavior would be a crocodile approaching an animal at, at the water's edge, quietly, stealthily, underwater, probably, uh, get as close as he possibly can, and then explodes into action, grabs one of the animals either by the head or wherever he really can. The croc jumped out of the water and put the impala in mid-air. We were so excited, couldn't believe my eyes were shaking. The poor impala were kicking. You can see a crocodile swimming rapidly to be at the exact spot, at the exact time. And when the impala comes down from its last leap, it lands right in the mouth of the crocodile. And he grabs the impala and swims away with his breath. It was really emotional. I was crying and shouting. Afterwards, they all jumped over. I don't know why. They were trying to cross at that specific spot. There's a moment where the crocodile swims next to the impala ramp, and you can gauge its size from that. This is a really big crocodile. When it was over, we were very quiet, very shocked and emotional about everything. I've never seen this. It shows the crocodile anticipating where he has to be. He's adjusted to swim speed to arrive there, not before the time, not after the time, but at the exact moment when the impala will be there. I felt so excited to see actually how cool Mother Nature can be.
We found a big pride with 16 lions, a big male, uh, some females and lots of cubs. And after a few days with them, just filming natural behavior, filming some interaction, I decided to test a new gadget, which was my remote control car, which we call like the bush buggy. I always like to use some new stuff, new gadgets, to bring the audience closer to nature. The lions were there, and I was on this side, put it in the ground, and I knew that was the opportunity to use this car. The big male, as soon as he realized there was something different, something new there, he just stood up and came straight for the car. He came straight, he didn't think twice, he just went straight for the car. And I could actually see that because I was using a goggle. Cats are a little bit uncertain about anything. Often use their paws, their front paw, that sort of just to try and touch and tip. You see it with a domestic cat. It's quite widespread in all cats that I've observed. Cheetahs and leopards do it as well. So it's almost in, a, in an investigative process when they encounter something that they, they're not too sure of. After playing a little bit, trying to discover and seeing that it's not a, something that could harm him, he just went for it. He grabbed it and took it. When I saw that, I said, oh my god, I lost it. I lost that, that equipment, and at least I was expecting to get some footage out of it. But how can I get that back and take it from the lion? It's almost impossible. So I had to wait. Nothing else to do, just wait. The behavior of picking it up and, and, and moving off with his prize, if you like, it's difficult to understand really why the animal is doing it. Possibly, he doesn't want the others to interfere. He wants to look at it or find out a bit more about it himself to see if it's good to eat. And then a female came and stole the car from the lion, the big male, and actually took the car inside the bride with all the scuffs. And imagine like 16 lions playing with the car, so everyone took a part of the car. So I didn't know if the camera was still recording. I lost the signal with the big male, and then when the female took the car, I couldn't see anything else. And it was like an hour and a half just waiting. So when it gets warm, in the savannas in Africa, the lion, they just look for a bush to rest in the shadow. They pass right by us, near our, our car, and everyone went to the bush. So I went back and got piece by piece. Yeah, the camera's really we had to go grab one, jump in the car, grab another one. There was still lions around, so we had to take care. The best part for me was being able to recover the camera and see that it was still running. Still working. <laughs> we got some excellent footage from inside the mouth. Very unique footage. I've never seen something like that. We saw from fairly deep instant a really good view of a lion's mouth. It showed the dentition of a lion off at, at, at really close quarters. The most important teeth are, on all carnivores are what we call the carnassials. Those are those teeth that you see very nicely at the back of the mouth that act like scissors with lions in particular that do eat lots of meat. They use those as slices. What I've learned from this experience is that lions has a totally different way to approach to new things. Filmmakers are always looking for interesting angles, different angles, but I suppose when you're subject to something like a lion, you've got to be prepared for the lions to take some action that perhaps you, you didn't want, but you land up with a, 
face shot of the inside of the lion's mouth, which is pretty unique. And what's fun to see the lions from inside the bride. photographers with me, the golden morning sunlight, um, I said the scenery was pretty, rocks, beach, green, water, and put a lap in that and they, you know, they were loving it. This young male was on the lookout for food, and at that age they're not really accomplished hunters, so you know, he's looking for small birds, reptiles, anything like that. And I saw a monitor that was basking in the sun uh, on the rock right at the edge of the water. And so the leopard slowly stalked a bit closer. A few seconds later, he just went after it, um, unexpectedly. And even more unexpectedly, did a full-on dive into the water after the leopard. Completely submerged under water, which is something I'd never seen before. When you watch this leopard stalk, he's only got eyes for the monitor lizard. He's not thinking of the water at all. And he does a very good job because, just think about it, there's not a lot of cover. But because the lizard is lying very close to the ground, just the shape of the rock actually hides its body for a long time. The leopard actually made very fast ground there at the end, but it was just not fast enough to actually catch the monitor lizard. He missed, um, and he sheepishly got himself out the water and kind of looked around. <laughs> I see young male leopards do almost exactly the same thing. And what I mean by this is they overcommit. So they go full speed at something that they probably never have a chance of catching and then end up in the water. I've never seen a leopard dive willingly head first into water and completely submerge himself. The leopards are very opportunistic and also adaptive. Leopards will adapt to their environment. So if there's any opportunity for them to get an easy meal, they'll take it. Even if it means getting their paws wet. <laughs> the funniest part was afterwards, when he kind of got out and he was a bit, you know, busy. I can't say that's how the leopard really felt, but it looked like he was embarrassed, kind of like shaking off the, the water. What I've learned from this is, yeah, you always expect the unexpected. Both from, you know, in fact, it's something you don't see every day, but also from a photography point of view, that was gold. We saw two young female lions lying basically on top of a ridge. They were just relaxing in the sun. There was a water hole just at, at the bottom, so maybe just waiting for animals to come through. We sat there for about two, three minutes before they actually went down in the stalk mode, and we had no clue what was actually going on. Everything just started happening so fast. They just went straight in the back mode. What did what just happen? It was less than probably 10 seconds from them getting into stalk mode to catching the best buck in the air and then falling right next to us. Lions like all cats are incredibly agile. One can easily be mistaken by thinking that they cumbersome because of their sheer size. But lions are incredibly flexible and subtle. She's able to turn in her head and bring the nest back down. Also what we're able to see is just the incredible strength of a lioness. She falls what is maybe two meters, lands flat on her back and is able to recompose herself straight away and complete the kill. What just happened? The thump of the lioness and the bear's bark actually falling on the ground right next to us was crazy. <laughs> the other lioness joined her and they suffocated it right next to us. Five minutes later, they dragged it back into the bush and it was over. As a ranger, you want to see these things. This is how the wild works. You can work in the bush for your whole life and not see a proper kill like, like we did. 
When I first saw this, I'd already ridden about 45 k's on the mountain bike and I was getting pretty tired. The adrenaline was really pumping and I had to ride really fast and as hard as I could back into town to get my camera and Marvin so that we'd come back out and capture this event. As we're getting in, Les explained to me that there was a snake that had killed a crocodile. Um, we pulled up to the car park, jumped out of the car, and then we pretty much ran down and, and we saw the snake around the crocodile. I was quite excited when I saw this happening because that's a once in a lifetime experience. We have an olive python, which is a native to Australia, catching a crocodile. Crocs have one of the biggest bite forces that has ever been measured. If the croc can get hold of the snake and shake its head, there's some serious consequences for the snake in that whole process. The snake must have surprised the crocodile because the crocodiles get away fairly quickly normally and he must have latched onto him and, and wrapped him up pretty quick. The snake probably got hold of the croc by just using ambush tactics, which pythons are well known to do. They will lie in wait for their prey to come to them. Snakes, especially pythons, are very much aware of the heartbeat of their prey and they will suffocate their prey until the heart stops. But crocodiles has got another advantage. They can go without oxygen for quite a while. Crocs frequently submerge and go sit underwater for up to an hour maybe. What I think happened in this case is that the snake constricted the crocodile so much that there wasn't room in the ribcage left for the heart to beat. And eventually the croc died of cardiac arrest rather than asphyxiation. Five minutes after we arrived, the snake went to the tail of the crocodile, started sniffing and then and then went around to the front and that's when it started um, eating the crocodile. Eating the crocodile face first is what pythons and, and other snakes usually do. If they do it the other way around, it can happen that the prey can get stuck and, and they can't get it down or they can't get it out either. We weren't very close at all because we didn't want to upset what was going on, but we knew the snake had its mouth full of crocodile and couldn't really do anything. It's amazing how the snake could open its jaw to fit the crocodile in. Pythons don't dislocate their jaws like some people will believe they do. They can expand their jaws rather than dislocating their jaws. While I was taking photos, I was extremely excited to be capturing this because I knew it was a fairly unique experience. And I'm an amateur photographer and I was pretty amazed that it was me that was capturing this event for everyone. It was one of the most amazing um, wildlife experiences that I've, I've been able to witness. Probably the best to see nature in its raw form, the life and death struggle that animals go through every day to survive. It was very exciting to pull up alongside a cheetah on a termite mound. And it was even more exciting when we noticed that she was preparing to hunt. A long way away, we could see about six gazelle in long grass. The cheetah then came down from the mound, walked forward a few paces, and hid behind an even smaller mound. The gazelle moved closer and closer. And then, eventually, there was a moment when each gazelle had its head down. It was grazing. At that point, the cheetah stood up and it didn't run, it walked slowly towards a gazelle that it had targeted. The cheetah waited right until the Thompson's gazelles all turned their backs towards her, and that's when she started running. And of course then, it's all about speed. The chase involved the gazelle running away from us, and then in an arc back towards us. is much slower than her, but she uses her tail to great effect to quickly change direction and then cut in on the angle, and that allows her to ankle tap Thompson's gazelle and then basically grab the pipe of her. So what happened next was the stage where the cheetah was suffocating the gazelle. That happened right in front of us. There were four of us in the vehicle, and I know we all felt very sad. 
who are realizing the brutal side of nature. You would think with the speed that cheetahs can run at that they can start running when they're still 100 yards away, but they can't do that. The thing that the cheetah did right in this case was she waited for the Thompson's gazelles to turn their backs towards her. And that gave her those few extra seconds to make up maybe an extra 15 yards or so. Interestingly enough, um, that afternoon we saw another cheetah kill. I've only ever seen two and they're both on the same day. But that one took place in long grass. There was plenty of cover, so the difference was the cheetah was a lot closer to the gazelle before it bounced. Also, when it caught the gazelle, it suffocated it quickly. And the third thing is that uh, when it finished killing the gazelle, it uh, made a chirping sound, like a bird. It was calling two cubs out of the grass. Our emotions were slightly different there. We were seeing a, a mother providing food for its two youngsters. There are pleasant sides to nature and unpleasant sides. And we've just seen something that perhaps was unpleasant, but it was a predator that needed to feed. I'm a biologist and I've seen lots of interesting and exciting things, but I've not actually seen anything like this before. there was a leopard in the tree just three kilometers up the road and then we got there and, yep there she was eating her lunch she began to bring the carcass down for whatever reason i don't know maybe she had a cub to feed the impala got caught and then she backed away backed away backed away and the length of the branch obviously wasn't as long as she thought when a leopard takes a carcass up the tree to keep it away from other predators or scavengers they very seldom feed on it in exactly one spot First, they try and put it somewhere where obviously the carcass won't fall out, but also where they can feed comfortably. But as they start feeding and the carcass changes shape and gets a little bit smaller, they have to move it so that it doesn't fall out of the tree. And I think that's what happened in this instance. So all of a sudden she ran out of branch and then her legs just fell. I was confused as to what was happening and then the acrobatics just took place. For some reason the leopard decided it's not going to let go. It hangs onto the impala all the time, but its weight and gravity pulls it down, and now it's just claws all over the place. Everyone was just there thinking, she's got to let go. It's, it's stuck, and she's hanging off the branch. And then all of a sudden, she let go, landed on the ground, and we never saw her again. Gravity obviously gets the better of her, and she plunges down to the ground. But she would have been back up in a couple of seconds. Instantly, once she'd left, I just realised that that is something that I'm never going to forget. First leopard I'd seen in a tree, and now first leopard that I've seen fall out of the tree. We were chasing dogtooth tuna, and I was free diving down about 17 metres, just having a look around the deeper ledges. Down there. And all of a sudden on the left side, I seen this tiger shark just turn its head at me like that. We sort of looked at each other, looked on each other's eyes, and it just sort of just darted at me from a good, I don't know, 30, 40 metres away, and it just kept coming. I thought it would slow down, but it didn't. Once I seen the tiger shark, I started swimming to the surface, and on my way up, I noticed that it was really not slowing down. It just kept coming up, turning away, coming back up, turning away, coming back up. Tiger sharks are often referred to as the garbage cans of the sea. They will scavenge on dead material, they'll hunt, They'll eat anything and everything, which also, of course, means that they'll try anything and everything. And often that means that if there is a human there, it has been known that they will try that human as well. 
<laughs> this tiger shark is clearly very persistent. And it's also very obviously decided that these two spear fishermen are not really a threat to it and are not enough to keep it away from getting the meal that it wants to get. The whole way up, I've got that tiger shark pretty much at my fins and at the tip of my spear gun. Uh, that's all that's between us. So the longer it went on, the more I wanted to get out of the water because I was like, this is starting to get out of control and I don't know what's going to happen. These are wild animals at the end of the day. They are unpredictable and you never know what they're going to do. It got to the surface and it started circling us and just swimming in front of us really slowly, looking at us with its big black eye. These spear fishermen realised that the shark was interested, and sharks often are. It's one of the facts about spear fishing. Sharks will often be interested in the bait or interested in what you're shooting. And instead of either harming the shark or forcing it off in a way that was somehow detrimental to it, I think it was a wonderful example of where they realised we're going to remove ourselves from the situation and not stay in something that could be potentially dangerous to us. And of course, the more shark-human negative interactions they are, the more dangerous it ends up being to the sharks. At the time, I was you know, excited, but also scared as well, because it was a decent tiger shark. Spearfishing is an interesting sport. What's great about spearfishing is that it's a completely selective method of fishing. It's also a sport that demands some expertise and some technique from the spearer themselves. Once we got to the boat, we were really excited. We screamed, yeah, awesome, fantastic. And we seen the tiger shark come out of the water. It was quite an adrenaline rush. Having a bit of a tiger shark swim at you. <laughs> Crocodiles can't chew. With the strongest measured bite force in the animal kingdom, they don't have to. This four meter croc tosses the 35 kilogram baby hippo like a pool toy. But since no adult hippo came to its aid, the baby was probably already dead. We are in Masai uh, Mara. We came across these three uh, cheetah brothers and thought we'd uh, stick around for a bit. We got uh, lucky when uh, they spotted a few zebra in the distance, and uh, one of them decided to go after them. Amazingly, they got one. The uh, one cheetah had the zebra with the grip around the uh, throat, kind of suffocated. And after a few minutes, they all dug in. Cheetah usually hunt small antelopes like the Palos or Thompson's gazelles. It's definitely the first time that I've ever seen them take down a zebra of that size. At first I thought it was three big male cheetahs, but when I look closely, it's actually an adult female with two sub-adults, and that makes it even more spectacular. What makes a cheetah unique is the fact that it chases down its prey at incredible speeds. Because they hunt at such high speeds, they're completely out of breath when they stop. So they're literally catching their breath before they can start eating. One of the biggest disadvantages for cheetahs is the fact that they hunt in open areas. And therefore, scavengers like vultures find the prey very easily. We saw some vultures come down. First it was one, and then pretty soon there were ten, and then it came to about a hundred of them. And I found it really interesting to watch. And creeping closer. Some of them walking forward, and they would hop a little bit, and the whole group of a uh, hundred of them moved closer, and then the cheetah decided to do a mock charge and chase them away. But it didn't face too many of them. Uh, they were little flying around. And then they came closer and closer, and the cheetah just decided to give up. <laughs> Vultures swamped the zebra, totally covered it. Couldn't see anything with a big pile of vultures on top. It's gone. 
And the last one uh, eating was intimidated, I guess, by the overwhelming force of uh, vultures. The moment that the vultures get onto the carcass becomes completely chaotic. Every single one of them tries to get a piece of meat. And that carcass will disappear literally within minutes. I've got a feeling that the slowest vultures aren't going to get a piece of meat in this car. You can go on a lot of safaris and not see a kill. Uh, so seeing the uh, zebra taken down by a cheetah is quite special. Oh. <laughs> We've managed to find a buffalo carcass. A female that had died while the herd had moved through. And that afternoon we found a female leopard and two cubs feeding on the carcass. The female leopard had started feeding on the buffalo around the head and neck and she opened up a nice little area for the cubs to feed. Few people actually realize how often leopard scatters. They're very opportunistic, so they'll take a great variety of prey, but when they're walking through the bush and they come across something dead, like this buffalo, they won't hesitate to scatter. Straight there after we pick up the fighter lines that would make noise sound. The direction they were heading was straight towards that buffalo carcass. So we immediately backed off and let, let nature take its course. Lions are at the top of the food chain, and if they find any other creatures on a carcass like that, busy scavenging, they'll try and chase them. First thing next morning before the sun was even up, we headed up and we went straight up to the sighting and true to form, the lions had taken over the carcass. They were sitting there feeding, you know, gorging themselves as much as they could. There's actually no way that a female leopard and two cubs would be able to take them by part of the lions with two massive males. They had to give up the carcass as soon as the lions made an approach. There was no sign of the leopards at first. After a few minutes sitting there watching, we spotted the leopard cub sitting at the top of the wattle, very, very high up. And eventually it moved and the lions managed to pick up on it and actually tried to climb the wattle, trying to get up to her. And she held her, held her nerve and she actually was climbed up to the very, very top of the tree and stayed put there for a while. Luckily enough, the wattle was a little bit too dense for them to actually even get up there. Lions can definitely climb trees, but for an animal like a male lion that's so heavy, not easy to get up a tree, at least not as easy as it is for a leopard. And once it's up there, to get to those branches right at the top, that'll be impossible. The lions never really gave up their pursuit of the leopards. They'd go gorge themselves and then go rest straight into the wattle and keep them permanent on it. They've killed wild bugs in the past, chased cheetahs, gone off the leopards and probably successfully taken leopards before. It was at this point that we picked up her mother who was circling the perimeter of the sighting. During that night, um, obviously the mother had made her way in and actually managed to extract the juvenile. And luckily enough, the leopard had made its, made its way out. And then the next morning, the lions were still just gorging themselves in the carcass. The entire ordeal for the juvenile leopard lasted about 36 hours. So for this leopard cub to actually be able to survive this encounter was actually exceptionally impressive for such a young, young female. I mean, even with trying to watch a probably close to 200 kilo male lion trying to find the small little wattle tree to get to it and this leopard cub holding strong and not panicking it was unbelievable to see. We were on a river, on a boat. The guide pointed us, ah, that's the basilisk. That's the lizard that can run to the water. We got close to the basilisk, he got scared, jumped in the water and ran right in front of us. It was the first time I saw that. Just incredible. They don't do that all the time. Only when they are in this specific location, like on a branch, near the water, and the fastest route to escape for something is the water so they can walk through the water. Basilisk lizard, also known as a Jesus lizard or a Jesus Christ lizard, uh, for the obvious inference that it can run on water. It's an amazing little lizard, it's very light and agile, and when alarmed or it needs to get away from a predator, it can run for short distances fully above the water. They can't stay up there for long, but just this initial run to get away from the initial threat. 
So a basilisk lizard is going to be very fast proportionally for the body size. It can probably go about one and a half meters per second, but they can't go that far. They go for about 15 feet tops. Then the momentum gives in, gravity kicks in, and they have to resort to swimming. They're also very good swimmers. The unique adaptation is that they've got little fringes on the outside toes. When they're on land, these are compressed against the side of the toes. When they're on water, they fringe out. And that increases the surface area of the animal um, and also for the surface tension of the water. So what the animal does is slap down and the slap down also creates an air pocket, which also helps the animal stay upright. And then we've got the backward motion of the animal. And you can see the, the motion of that lizard that it's moving its legs round to the side. They definitely have natural predators. You're looking at birds, snakes, and bigger lizards. It's a very small lizard, so if you're not looking out for it, you're going to miss it. After that, I saw other basilisks in you know, other areas in Costa Rica, but they didn't do the same behavior. So I was pretty lucky. Samara, we were driving around, it was the migration time, and uh, we saw a young Topi getting born, and it's very, very rare to see this. It's always nice to see new life in the beginning of, of something like that. And unfortunately, this little Topi that was born, he was a bit slow in getting up. And then all of a sudden, over the horizon, this lion had started walking, and she was focused on something. She walked straight into where we were, and at uh, 30 or 40 meters, she broke into a light trot and she just ran the tuppy down, and there was nothing the mother could do. So our eyes and ears out there, and if any predator sees what's going on, it's going to take advantage of it, and that's exactly what the lioness did. And there was nothing that the mother Topi could do. What was remarkable, even that neonate, that baby, I was amazed how fast it could run. Even after that, not being born more than 10 or 15 minutes, it could still have a semblance of a chance of getting away. We did not see that lioness while the Topi was being born. Something had alerted her that there was other a new birth. It could have been a bachelor, eagle, or a vulture. And she went and investigated, and she got lucky. She knew this was an easy snack, and so there wasn't any real need to put in a huge effort. Caught the youngster very, very easily. It's those first few weeks of life for all animals that are critical when they are so immobile, they are so helpless. She quickly went into some um, taller grass so that there was no movement and the others couldn't see her feeding. This is an example of the side of nature that we somehow don't like to recognize, we don't like to see. We always think of nature as anything that's been beautiful and harmonious. And of course, it's not like that at all. It's very hard, but it's a survival of the fittest. And infant mortality is in fact, in nature, the most common form of mortality. Life out here on the African plains is tough for the wild animals. And only with that death of an animal would allow the life of that lioness and her cubs to survive.